Well, thank you to all the presenters. Those were really great presentations. Oh, they are going to stand up. They said they were quite comfortable sitting over there, but obviously I've managed to twist their arms a little. So we've got a number of questions here, and so who's highlighting? Who's our highlighting person? Right, let's go for the top one, shall we? And this is with respect to tree sterility. How much extra volume do you expect if trees aren't wasting energy on reproduction? And that's probably for Glenn. Yeah, I, I didn't mention a lot of those sort of things. That's one of the reasons, I guess, we want to do a field trial so we can actually measure that, because we don't really know. But generally, there are a lot of publications saying 15 to 20 percent of the energy of the tree goes towards reproduction. So we'd assume if we stopped it reproducing, at least some of that should go to producing extra growth. But we really need to test the trees to see whether they're actually doing it. Yeah, well, I suppose picking up on the next one down, um, Glenn, how do you first identify the sterility genes to edit? Yeah, so we use a number of different approaches to that. We rely quite a lot on looking at these lab rat systems where they know a lot about reproduction, but they have some distinct differences to conifers, and so we also rely on the conifer genomes, which are available for Douglas fir. as a sequence genome. So largely we try and look for genes which have the effect we want in other species, look whether they're actually in Douglas fir, and then look if they're being expressed in the right sort of tissues, and then select those on that sort of basis. At a very good shop down Wellington, actually, and it was only $600. <laughs> or thereabouts. Right, next question. Um, Keith, do you look at the productivity differences between fixed and dangle heads? Yeah, um, there was uh, a bit of a study looking at, at, part of the time study was looking at the uh, productivity between the two harvester heads. Um, the short answer is that there wasn't much of a difference um, and we didn't publish that in our report because the key objective was really to look at the breakage. So uh, yeah, there was a productivity difference but not, not major. And I'm assuming this is for Keith again, is there a difference in average stump height between fixed head and dangle head? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, to my knowledge, I don't believe that they went down and measured stump heights. All the data was collected from the landing using the, the STICS database through the process ahead. So um, we don't have any data on, on the stump height differences. And this is one for Tara. How fast does the extreme fire advance with shrub or tree fuels? Uh, so there Just hold it right up. Yeah. There's a difference? Oh. Try, try another one. It might be turned on. Uh, so there's definitely a difference between shrubs and fire in how fast it spreads. Uh, conifers and deciduous are different as well. So conifers are very fast, deciduous less fast, and then scrub um, is a little less than that. However, the fastest fire, surprisingly, is grass. <laughs> okay. So the next one, Keith, would you... <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling to find the relevance to Iraq there, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question, so maybe yeah. somebody would like to repeat Would leaving it. anybody got oh well, let's see. We're leaving a buffer between waterways. Oh, so it's, it's, a, it's about riparian buffers. Would that be a, an effective mechanism to um, contain slash? Yeah, the um, previous work that's been done looking at the effectiveness of riparian um, margins, I, th I think, shows that there are breakouts um, through riparian margins. Um, maybe um, Brenda Bailey might be able to answer this one a bit better than me. You're, you're probably a bit more qualified. Uh, 
Yeah, I think what we're looking at, we're trying to do here is, is reduce the risk, particularly from these large scale events and the um, landslides and debris flows, um, which have a significant impact. And the Wiperian buffers um, have a very limited capacity to either stop or slow down um, those kinds of mass movements of sediment and logging slash off the hill. You maybe if you just get small rainfall events, you might they might be wide enough and have a good structure to stop a little bit of it. But for these extreme rainfall events, um, once a landslide gets going and it translates into a debris flow, it'll go straight down the hillside and straight through the riparian buffer. Thank you, Brenda. Right, what have we got? Don, what's the impact if an alternative to methyl bromide is not available in November 2020? I'm not sure if the question is directed at me personally or at the industry. For me personally, I retire. Because um, <laughs> it all gets too hard at that point. Uh, the reality, though, in all seriousness, is we've got a serious problem. Um, and to be quite honest, we don't have an answer at this point. So it is pretty serious. We are continuing to push for approval of EDN. We are talking to our trading partners about acceptance because we're trying to run these things in parallel rather than in sequence. Um, the alternative is probably a change in shipping schedules so that we don't... Uh, what it means is the end of the Indian market, but it also means for China there'll be, apart from debarked logs, there'll be um, only under deck cargo. So that will increase shipping costs um, and may generate some issues around ship availability because uh, there's not necessarily enough ships, particularly with the new low sulphur fuel requirements coming in in January. Sorry, it's not, it's not good news. So Tara, what tree stocking densities influence the risk or speed of fire spread in plantation forests? So your risk is definitely increased if the fuel is continuous. So if you picture that the forest canopy is actually really just a tall grass and as the branches reach out, they touch, a continuous fuel is a lot riskier than a fuel that has breaks. Mm. And for Marco, what's the cost of thermal modification? Uh, yeah, good question. Obviously, it's, it's going to add another step to the processing of, of these species. We haven't, got, we haven't done the economic analysis fully yet, but it can't be done in the same kiln as used for drying. So you do dry these species like you normally would, and then you will need to put them through a separate specialised kiln for the thermal modification. But if you can lift that species into another end use, which you, you can't get to untreated, then that, that would, I think it would, would add up. There are some... Um, companies like um, Abodo who do sell thermally modified timber and so they are doing that economically so although I don't have the numbers I think we can make an economic um, product out of it. So there don't seem to be any other questions here but I'm going to throw one at Tara um, and it's going back to that fire risk spread. Given the science that you've just generated, what does this mean for carbon forests, especially when they're planted on the dry east coast of New Zealand? I think given the trend in our climate, given what we're seeing overseas, our risk is increasing. It's increasing all over, particularly in our driest regions. Marlboro is increasing. The east, coast, the east Cape is increasing. Uh, Canterbury remains relatively the same. But I think the problem that we're starting to see is that our shoulder season is extending out, just like we're seeing overseas. And each fire, I mean, if you just think about the last five years, we've had the worst fire every single year or every other year in the last five years. And so we do just see this going up and going up and going up. And I do believe if it continues on this trend, New Zealand will need to enter a space where they live with this fire risk the way other countries do. So following on, there's another question that's popped up, um, a comment on Jane, James Wenwick's talk last night, and the question is, is New Zealand equipped to deal with an increase in the incidence of extreme fire? Not at the moment, but we're working on it through this program. 
Um, further question, do we know which economic tree species are the least vo uh, vulnerable to fire? That's a good question, and the answer to that is there's been a lot of research, both overseas and in New Zealand, about flammability and flammability of the species. What has, so it's individual species, so it's whether or not the leaf ignites or the, the needle ignites. Um, in New Zealand, it's been primarily about natives, because natives ignite, it's a lot more difficult to ignite natives. So we haven't really looked in the New Zealand environment. Overseas, it's deciduous, deciduous, is like oak, for example, eucalypts, of course, that, uh, that ignites really easily. Um, so it, it varies, but the, the key is, is that what's not been done is a full ecosystem understanding. So a cabbage tree leaf, for example, is actually really difficult to ignite, but if you ignite that whole cabbage tree, it will explode. Okay, so that stepping it up has not been done. Okay, here's one. How is the use of debarking viewed by our markets? I guess that's for you, Don. Yeah, debarking is uh, accepted by China as a, as a risk mitigation tool. It's not a phytosanitary treatment, uh, but it is considered to be a risk mit mitigation tool. Um, it's not accepted by India. Uh, and they, at this stage, appear completely unwilling even to discuss it, whereas China has been happy to accept it. It does, um, as, as the amount of debarked log being exported to China increases, we increase the risk of interceptions uh, through two me mechanisms. One is just straight, the more logs you send, the more chance of an interception. But we also see a shift from uh, debarking pruned logs, which are generally fairly cylindrical and got no branch holes and things in them, to um, debarking lower grade logs, A grade and K grade, and they inevitably come with um, <coughs> sometimes a bit of fluting, sometimes uh, depressions around the branch stubs, and obviously in, in particularly in older logs, some, some dead branches coming out of those logs. So we do increase the risk. Um, it's, it is an option at this stage, but it's something we need to, um, to manage carefully. And a follow-up, is there any movement in China um, with regard to fumigation on arrival at port? Uh, yes, there is, and generally it is the Chinese are shutting down their fumigation facilities for the same reasons that we want to stop using it here. Um, methyl bromide is a, is a greenhouse gas, or is an ozone destroyer, and globally, phytosanitary treatment is in fact the only exemption to the ban on the use of methyl bromide that the international protocols have, have agreed to through Montreal. Um, so the Chinese, as they want, as they work to improve their own environmental standards, are saying, well, why do we want to import somebody else's methyl bromide problem? Uh, if you want to use methyl bromide, use it at home. And of course, that's potentially an issue for us to consider when we look at Korea and Japan, where we currently don't have to uh, fumigate to send logs there, and they fumigate on arrival. Um, so it's just something we need to be conscious of and aware of and continue to look for. As I said, the future is, has to be a non-chemical one. It's how we achieve that that's important. This one for Marco, how do we give greater confidence to growers that other species are economically viable? I think there's a range of a range of things we need to do there. So starting at the at the the planting end, we need to make sure we know where these things will thrive in terms of just actually you know growing them. So that's step one. Um, as you heard from Tara, we're making sure we select the right families or the right provenances in terms of tolerance to any sort of insect browsing. Um, the development of new products, which I've talked about, is, is, another, is another barrier. Um, the regional strategy work we're doing, that, that's about in, you know, getting the right tree at the right place is great, but if you haven't got the right scale, um, it's also not going to work for you. So that's where our regional strategy comes in. Where it's, so like, if we're going to look at durable eucalypts in this area, let's make sure we focus only on a few species rather than having 500 different species planted in an area. and then that will have a resource that will then attract some sort of processing. So if, we, if we're planning for veneer, let's make sure we've got the scale right, and that's, that's making sure we can get rid of that barrier um, to planting. 
Okay, we haven't got any more questions on the screen, but the, is there anyone out there who can't work their cell phone who's got a question that you're just dying to ask? We could bring a roving mic down. Yes, I have a, a question for Glenn, and it's not about the science or technology, but the legal aspects. Um, and this has to do, as an example, in a food product, and whether that a similar thing would exist for pine, that in the United States, uh, with uh, genetic editing of um, corn, um, corn species were growing next to organic farms where corn was also growing. Uh, the corn species were contaminated by the genetically modified ones. And Monsanto sued those farmers for having corn with their genetics imprinted in their crops when they didn't want them to be there. So you, you're talking about sterile, it's not a food product, which is great. Uh, you're talking about sterile trees, which is great, so they can't contaminate a, 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 you know, there's a, 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 um, a legal precedent that when you change a, a genetic, genetically change an organism, it's a patented life form owned by a corporation as distinct from natural seeds. So, so how certain are you that the, the seeds and the, and the trees will be sterile? They won't cross-contaminate other species that we have and under the TPP be liable to a legal suit by a huge timber corporation. Okay, <laughs> so, we'll get the, so, the, so the question is how certain are you we're not going to get cross-contamination? So yeah, that was quite a few questions. <laughs> I guess the benefit of doing it by gene editing is that you just recreate mutants that exist in the wild anyway, but because of the nature of conifers, you can't propagate them in the wild. So there are some wild sterile mutants of conifers out there. It's just you can't take a cutting and reproduce from that. You have to go back to the tissue culture to do it. And so we'd really be in the same position that we'd be creating sterile mutants, which would have exactly the same characteristics as a wild type one, which is why it's sort of viewed a little bit differently to genetic modification. But I mean, that is the reason once again where we need to do a field trial is to actually test whether these are sterile. How are we going for time, Russell? Just, just about there. Oh, very good. Well, thank, thank you, team, for um, giving some very good answers to those questions and keeping well on track. I think we've finished ahead of time, so well done from me.